Um, I mean, I started to cook when I was, honestly, about seven years old. Uh, very fortunate to have grown up with uh, my two Italian nonne, so my two Italian grandmothers, both of whom are f uh, from Toscana. So we're from Toscana. Okay. Um, I have a big family, and I was obligated, really, to help with the cooking because I have 10 brothers and sisters and I'm one of the oldest. And so that's really where the love of, you know, cooking and food and uh, being at the table uh, came about. I always felt incredibly sentimental about being Italian and uh, used to come to Italy as often as I possibly could. And at a certain point, uh, and I was in the restaurant business very uh, early on, uh, owned a restaurant with my brother in the Bay Area, worked for a number of chefs there, including Chez Panisse. But I really was just doing that to put myself through school, to tell you the truth. Okay. Uh, but I ended up owning a restaurant, uh, and that was a great experience, and loved it, and then swore I'd never own another one. Um, and one thing led to the other, I went into high tech. Where I was in high tech, in Silicon Valley for about 25 years. And uh, during one of the first really big downturns that probably all of us remember, maybe not you, Paula, but maybe, depending on, you guys were selling wine to California, yeah. <laughs> Silicon Valley had a really yeah. big downturn. Yeah. And I took the opportunity to take a year off and come to Italy to study the language because I spoke what we spoke at home, uh, but I never studied it. And so I wanted to go to language school. I wanted to live in Italy for uh, at least a year. And that's what I did. Uh, I took uh, that year and went to language schools all over Italy. There was not a language school in Piemonte, so I, I didn't come here to go to language school, but came here for the wine, really. And one thing just led to the other, fell in love with the area and the people and um, and ended up staying. It wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't an, an easy transition and it took a lot of thought mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a little bit of craziness. Uh, but that was almost 20 years ago. So I would say it was 19, 18, 19 years ago that I... I did that. Okay. And even though I swore I'd never have a re another restaurant, <laughs> here I am and loving every minute of it. So I'll drink to Piemonte. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the Italian Piemonte? So, when, and w when did you open Castello di Signo? What? In, in what year did you open Castello di Signo? Did we lose her again? Yeah. I opened in the fall of 2005. Okay. So started the project uh, in about 2002, 2001, 2002, and opened uh, when was rushing, you know, crazy to open so that I would be open for the Olympics the following February. All oh, right, in, in, in Torino, see, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and it really was. You know, I was pedaling as fast as I possibly could. So I opened the second week of September. And I see that John Rittmaster is in the group. Yes. And if I'm not mistaken, John's group, and I did a, I did a tour for John's group even before the, the Castello was open. So, of course, I used other hotels and stuff. But he was my very first group <laughs> And uh, when we opened, I still hadn't gotten, you know, this, the Costello had been in such a bad shape and really open, like literally open to the outside for so long that uh, even when John came, I was, I still didn't completely feel like I had all of the outside, outside, you know. Denise. Denise. Yeah, there's John. Pile Okay. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? That again, John? Do 
John, we didn't get that. You said something. We he did. I didn't hear completely. That's well. That's all right. of rocks. All right, never mind. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's let, let's go ahead. Go ahead, Denise. Okay. So, to open in uh, September of two thousand and five, and have never looked back. And this would have been, I would have been celebrating my, well, I still am celebrating my 15th year of the hotel and restaurant being open. Just celebrating a little bit differently this year, so. <laughs> a little okay. bit. All right, well, let's, let, I want to, let me go back to Paula and we'll talk about some of the wines here. Yes. Paula, everybody wants to know, of course, about Canubi, well, Renate as well, but I'm gonna yes. put up a, a beautiful picture you sent me of your part of Canubi. And if you could talk about that. And yes, gorgeous, gorgeous photo. Uh, this is the, the, the wine cellar we have uh, in uh, Canubi Boskis. And uh, of course, the, the vineyard you see uh, under the house and uh, on the right side of the house is our part of uh, Canubi Boskis. Uh, so we said Canubi Boskis because uh, Boskis was the family name of the old owner of this uh, farmhouse and uh, so this is the first part of the hill uh, you know uh, close to Canubi Boskis there is uh, uh, Canubi the, the, the heart of the area that has uh, no other names and then we go to the town of Barolo with Canubi San Lorenzo, Canubi Moscatel, Canubi Valletta and so on. Um, I said before usually uh, we uh, blend the grapes coming from uh, Boskis and from the heart of the Canubi, but uh, uh, we stopped in 2015 because we had to replant a part of the vineyard. This is why, in, uh, for example, in 2016 we have a little smaller production than uh, usually because we, we have to wait that the, the heart of Canubi uh, has a little older vines, and then we will, of course, start blending them again. I said, if I can just say something here, you mentioned 2016, and I tasted the wine, I, I made a note, I sent you an email, but I yes. will we'll probably taste another 50 or 60 Barolo at least from 2016. I've tasted about yes. 70 so far. It, and it, I don't normally say this, but, but that wine, the 2016 Canubi, is, it's the best wine that I've tasted so far. It's just, I put down, it was a monumental Canubi. And, and so, yes, you know, uh, my oh, uncle is uh, 96 years old this year. Okay. How old? And, uh, uh, 96. Wow, okay. Well, a lot of years. And as we pick up the grapes during harvest in 2006, he said he had never seen so beautiful grapes. And I think this is the, the reason uh, why 2016 is a very good vintage. So it was also a little, uh, it was an easy vintage for us, uh, a long vintage, because you remember we had a mild uh, winter, we had more rain in spring, and of course, this was uh, good for our uh, for the ground, for our uh, water reserve that we need, of course. And uh, we had the possibility to pick up the grapes in the second part of October. That is the, of course, that is the optimum for the Nebbiolo grape. So we had uh, sugar, we had uh, acidity and we had uh, um, a good polyphenolic uh, concentration. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, malic acid was low, so every uh, element was perfect for having a wine able to be aged for a long Great. time. Let, let me ask you just in general about Canubi. I asked this to all the producers yeah. who, who make a, a Canubi Barolo and have a little parcel of, that, of that, the hill. What is so special about Canubi? I, I think everybody, when they study Barolo, the first vineyard they learn is Canubi, and it has yes, such a great know. history. What, 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 in your opinion, makes Canubi so special? Why is it a great place uh, to uh, be? Usually, so we say that in uh, Canubi uh, we have uh, so all the the the, uh, the elements that uh, we have in the La Morra area, so uh, on the other side of the hill. 
uh, and also the best conditions we have in the area of Montfort. So it's a mix uh, of elements uh, that bring the canopy to be uh, the, the, the heart of the production. Of course, it, it uh, has also a very long history and this is why this area is uh, well known and of course uh, the, uh, the producer uh, like to have a small production of uh, this type of wine. Of course, the grape position is uh, south, southeast to the sun, okay. and about the ground, uh, there is a lot of sand in it. Uh, so this means that this wine is elegant, but at the same time, has all the elements for being aged for a long time. Uh, this is why, so uh, uh, maybe also in uh, USA, you drink very old wines and uh, uh, of course, you have the opportunity to taste uh, very old Barolo Canubi, and usually they perform well, of course, when we have a good uh, vintage uh, to taste. Well, I think uh, all, your, all your Barolos perform well, so... <laughs> oh, <thank laughs> <you>. <laughs> now, I, I've heard a legend that, because the, the, when you read the books, they always say, well, this is the place where the two major soil types, the, the younger yes. Zarconian, and the older the Helvetian or so the Cerebellian come, come together. And I've heard, I've heard that the name Canubi is, is kind of a derivation of, of the word, like, like a, a canubial uh, joining of two people, like a wedding. Is, is that true? Have you heard that? Uh, no, so Canubi uh, means, so there are different, um, so we don't know exactly why the name is Canubi. So, you know, uh, our old label was Barolo Canubio. Yes, um, yes um, because this was the old name, we found our, our, on our uh, bookkeeping uh, uh, registers. Um, uh, so Canubio, uh, my uncle says that uh, in the past, uh, there were um, in uh, some areas of Canubi uh, more uh, canne. I don't know exactly the name in, uh, in English. More beef? Uh, Cattle? Carne. Maybe Denise can help us. Cattle? You, 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 said, you said carne, C-A-R-N-E. Le canne that were uh, in some areas of this hill, and this is probably the name. Uh, okay. But uh, So our old label was Barolo Canubio, starting with Barolo 2010. You know, uh, the maps went to Rome, uh, the areas went uh, uh, so now we have an official uh, name, and the name is Canubi. This is why we had to change a little the label, even if, of course, the, the vineyard is the, the same. We had okay. also 100 and more years ago. All right. Now, your other famous Barolo, I don't have a picture of the vineyard, I'm sorry, but it's Brunate. So tell us yes. a little bit about Brunate. So Brunate, you know, is uh, half in the town of Barolo and half in the town of La Morra. Um, so uh, we own nearly two hectares that uh, my great my grandfather bought in 1936, and our area is in the middle of the hill. Uh, so half in Barolo and half in La Morra. Of course, also in this case we mix the grapes because it's only one uh, vineyard. Uh, so there is less uh, sand in the soil. Um, we have a big amount uh, of uh, uh, loam and clay in uh, brunate, uh, magnesium and uh, potassium. Usually uh, we have uh, a not so intensive color, but uh, elegant in your nose. And uh, of course the position of the vineyard is uh, south, southeast to the sun. So we have the, the morning sun and uh, we have sun all the, all the day. Are, are the two vineyards, are they harvested normally about the same time or is Brunate a little bit later? Uh, of course, so we, uh, usually we start with Brunate because Brunate is a little more far from our wine cellar. Okay. So, of course, we crash the grapes all in our wine cellar in uh, Barolo. Uh, so, we start with Brunate, we need nearly so three, four days, and then we go to Canubi and uh, to all the other vineyards we own that um, are uh, producing the grapes for our Barolo Classico. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to speak also about our Barolo Classico. Oh, because, you know, in the past, uh, 
uh, there was only one Barolo and uh, Barolo was produced with all the grapes, so with the blend of the grapes coming from the town in Barolo, La Morra and uh, Castiglione Falletto. Um, we have all the vineyards like uh, Sarmassa that is in Barolo, Vignane that is in Barolo. So Vignane is, uh, I think, uh, is going to be interesting also in the future. Is a good area in Barolo um, that is uh, west to the sun. So maybe in very hot vintages or looking to the climate changing uh, are, be, are going to be interesting also in, in the future. Uh, we have a bigger area in Rocche dell'Annunziata in La Morra and in Codana in Castiglione Falletto. We blend all the grapes for our Barolo Classico. The way of producing the wine, of course, is the same. So we have long fermentation on the skin, nearly three weeks. Okay. Um, and then only when we have no sugar left in our wine, we put out the skin. And as you said before, we age our wine only in big wood. Slavonian oak, all the barrels we have, have been changed in the last 15 years. And uh, the capacity is between 20 and 50 hectoliters. Okay. Usually we age our Barolo three years uh, in big wood. Now we talked a couple days ago when we were just sort of practicing and, and you had a special announcement and it's, I, apparently some people know about this, others are asking a question, but you mentioned Rocca de la Nunciata and some of the grapes go into your classical. Yes. But yes. go ahead and tell, tell the, 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 the announcement. About Rocca de Nunciata. Yes. So of course it's um, it's nearly one hectare, so it's not a so small uh, parcel. Um, and starting with the Barolo 2018, we will have a single vineyard, Barolo Rocca de la Nunciata. So a part of the grape, of course, uh, will remain in our Barolo Classico, and uh, half of the grapes uh, are in a single. Uh, are used for a single vineyard, so we will have a, a new label in uh, with Barolo 2018. That's great. We hope, of course, the wine uh, will be good. At the moment, we are happy with our tastings. Uh, we have very sweet uh, tannins. Uh, the wine looks uh, quite elegant. And um, so we hope uh, you will enjoy the wine in the future <laughs> when we are going to bottle it. I'm sure. And I've heard many good things from other producers about 2018. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so 2018 was, uh, was a, a really classic vintage. We had a little more to work in the vineyards because we had uh, rain in uh, spring, a lot of rain. <laughs> Uh, but we had a good second part of the season, so we harvested the grapes uh, uh, the, the first week of uh, October. Of course, this was uh, a little more difficult vi uh, vintage compared, for example, with the 2016. Uh, we had to do a lot of green harvesting because we had more grapes, and uh, of course, with uh, more rain, you have uh, to, to work a little more. But at the end, we were very happy with the vintage that looks uh, a vintage able to, to be aged for, uh, for a long time because all the elements are uh, in a good balance. Great, I'm looking forward to that one. I know everybody is. So. One other <laughs> Barolo, and then we, I want to switch over to, back to Denise and talk a little bit about some of the food, some of the food she would serve with uh, Barolo. But you, ha you made a Reserva Canubi from the 2013 yeah, so We made a Reserva for the first time with Barolo Canubi 13. Um, we had a very small quantity of uh, bottles. We had nearly 1,300 uh, bottles. Okay. Uh, and so, of course, they were sold out uh, so immediately because we uh, speak about that with our old importers and uh, uh, so it was, it was easy to, to sell them. Uh, yes, of course, 2013 was a very good vintage. Eccola. Well there. <laughs> this is the label. And uh, of course, yes, uh, 
a very good vintage. Uh, this is why we decided to have a reserve. Maybe we will choose some vintages. We don't have a reserve all the, vin all the years. For example, we will have the next one in 2015. Okay. That is now in the cellar and we are going to bottle end of this year. Of course, uh, some bottles with the 2016, even if the quantity is usually uh, very small because uh, uh, so we, we enjoy to have nearly uh, 1,000, 2,000 bottles, not more. And, and one other question that someone asked is that will you do that only the preserver for the Burgonate, I'm assuming for the Canubi, or will you also do some? Only for the Canubi. So only for Canubi. Uh, now we okay. are producing only the reserva for Barolo Canubi. Okay. At the let's, moment. let's get back to Denise, who's sitting there very politely and listening to all this. And Denise, tell me about, I've got your menu in front of you. And if you could tell me just a little bit about, I mean, it, it, it's having been there so often and, and, and eaten in so many wonderful re restaurants, Trattoria, Osteria, there's so many classic dishes. I mean, how did you, when you, opened up Castello di Signo, the restaurant. How did you approach that from your background? How, how, how were you gonna, you know, how much tradition versus how much innovation versus? Yes, um, you know, to begin with, um, I mean, it is uh, uh, not just, you know, somewhat of a scary proposition to be, you know, having an American cooking for Italians, but it's a big responsibility because you're, you know, preparing and offering food that you want to, um, you know, showcase the producer's wines in the best light that you can. So I have to admit that I think I played it pretty uh, conservatively. Okay. Um, uh, where I did very traditional dishes. Um, and also because uh, I think that I followed my mother's advice. My mother is a, a, a music and voice coach. And we all took piano lessons from her and singing lessons and stuff. And I didn't want to play her music. I wanted to play jazz. <laughs> and she right. wasn't going to let me go there. You know, she really believed that you had to, you had to learn the classics. First, you had to learn those rules before you could start breaking them. So I think I kind of relied on that advice and I stuck pretty close to the classics and really tried to do uh, my best at those. And I have to say that I would have producers come into the restaurant and eat and say, oh my gosh, you know, your fondue is better than ours. I did rely on what I brought with me, my family traditions and also uh, cooking in California during the California, you know, cuisine movement, using the freshest possible local ingredients. Sure. So, um, you know, right out of the gate, I stayed pretty close to that. But uh, I personally, especially coming from California and having traveled all over Italy and a lot of the world, um, uh, I start to get bored doing the same old, same old. But I've always tried to really respect the traditions and build off of those and maybe add little surprises, little twists. Certainly, I would say uh, my cuisine is lightened up for modern sensibilities. And, um, and uh, I want the flavors to be really distinct. You know, if you're gonna, something written on a menu uh, that there's a little bit of something in there, I want that to come through. Um, so very distinctive, clean flavors, light, but really a huge respect for tradition. And honestly, tradition in general, the traditions here in the area, the Cucina Langarola, but also my own traditions, you know, my family traditions, and various other traditions uh, throughout Italy. So I draw on different parts of Italy. Once I've traveled somewhere, I'll, I always have to bring something back okay. with me. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I, I, just for an example, I'm looking at the menu that was, the current menu that you have off the website, and the first thing that's listed under Primi is the Costa Classic Tallarine, the famous handmade pasta made from 30 egg yolks, 
but you have it with lobster bisque, which I've never seen anywhere else. Right. Um, I don't know why I thought that that was, you know, really going to work, but it, it does. I also, I mean, I, I think that tangerine is such a fantastic pasta. Sometimes I toy with the idea of having, you know, nothing but tangerine on the menu with a bunch of different kinds of preparations. <laughs> I think that you could do yeah. that. Yeah. Good. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about since, and I want to let everybody know that, you know, while I was interviewing Denise about a month ago on Skype, just for a, a new book I'm working on, you all have that announcement now, look for that soon, uh, about Piemonte, is that, you know, I said I was doing webinars and Denise said, hey, I, I want to be part of this. And, and I said, well, let's, let's, you know, add a producer. And I just happened to have the bottle of Francesca Rinaldi Canubi in front of me. And I said, make sure you buy this. And she started to tell me about she has several vintages of this. She's been buying the wines for years. So I thought it would be fun to, pa to pair the two of you together. And I think it's working out well. So tell me uh, for, well, let's, let's do both the Classico and Barolo and then either the Canubi or the Bernati or Cru. What, what would you pair with, with those wines? With the, first with the Barolo Classico? Yes. Well, I'm not opposed to uh, even starting the evening with Barolo. So there are certain <laughs> All right. antipasti. I'm not that, either, yeah. Okay. You know, you could, you could pair with uh, the Barolo Classico, I think, very well. So, for instance, um, probably on that menu, I do change the menu fairly often, but I'll bet you anything there's a porcini flan uh, with fonduta and sauteed porcini yeah. and i think the borolo classico would go beautiful with that as a starter and i have to say that a lot of my guests will start you know they'll have a bottle of borolo um and sometimes a bottle and a half that will go all the way through uh through their evening right so i, I think that there are certain antipasti that would go very well and certainly the preemie um, uh, especially if you've got sort of an earthy flavor and or the dish has some real richness to it. So, um, I, I see pappardelle here with sauteed chanterelle mushrooms. That, that sounds like an ideal match. Yeah, so that, that, uh, I love that dish. It is, um, a long, slow cooked capretto. So it's not, it's not really a, a ragu in a traditional sense. I'll bake the capretto long and slow and then pick all of the meat off of it. Uh, and so the meat is really nice and tender. And actually the sauce goes together kind of at the last minute with um, a little bit of olive oil, some butter, thyme, a um, bit of lemon zest, uh, sun-dried tomatoes, and just a little bit of uh, hot peppers. And the Barolo Classico would go fantastically with that. Great. And in fact, the Barolo Classico and also Brunate. There's something that I want to say about the Francesco Rinaldi wines. I've been buying them for all of these 15 years, been a huge fan. Um, and uh, because I work in the dining room as well as in the kitchen during dinner service, I will take the orders in the dining room before I run back to the kitchen and uh, jump on the line. So I am often called upon to recommend uh, a Barolo. And uh, if somebody isn't really familiar with Nebbiolo, uh, my sort of go-to that I know will work every time and they'll love it, my go-to recommendation uh, for a very long time has been Francesco Rinaldi Brunate. It just never ceases to please. And I think that that would go well with some of the stronger uh, primi, but also the lighter meats, especially uh, preparations where the meat is cooked al momento. So uh, something like uh, a, a, a filet of pork or uh, a pork loin, um, or a duck, uh, so some of the lighter meats, and even, I will say this, even uh, steaks, 
because a stake really isn't all that, you know, it's not like powerful. The steak is quite delicate. So, you know, if you are cooking a filetto or um, a New York or something like that, I find that the more elegant, sort of softer, a little juicier wines like a Brunate uh, go beautifully. And I think is a better pairing with those kinds of meats. And then the Kanubi for things that are a little bit stronger because Kanubi, while it has beautiful fruit, is a little earthier. Paula also makes uh, other wines besides Barolo. Of course, that's what I was <laughs> interested in. But, but you, she mentioned the Green Lino and, of course, the Fresa in the future. And my favorite, Dolcetto, and which oh. I'm on campaign, I've been on a campaign until, the, until they carry me away to, to get people to drink Dolcetto. And I've had so many lovely versions. And, of course, 18 and 19 are out now. Great, great vintages for Dolcetto. What, uh, what do you like with Dolcetto? in terms of your, your, well, your... What would go with Dolcetto? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, just nothing works better than a Vitello Tonato okay. with, uh, with Dolcetto. Right. And I agree that uh, Rinaldi's Dolcetto is fantastic. I've always, always had that. Um, uh, carne cruda works. Um, what are some of the antipasti that I have on that menu, Tom? Oh, I didn't print that out. I have to look up on the other computer, but I'm going to put up a picture of your dining room, by the way, okay? I don't have any pictures of food, but there's your dining room. Let me find the antipasti on the menu here one second. Well, there's, um, you know, sometimes I do a, a rollata of coniglio filled with foie gras, and even though it's kind of fancy ingredients. The dolcetto pairs with it beautifully. Um, I usually do that with preserved figs, and uh, the preserved figs and the foie gras and the uh, and the and the coniglio and dolcetto is just a fantastic, fantastic pairing. Yes, I, I see the uh, duck breast here with uh, rhubarb. What? I see a duck breast here with rhubarb dressing. This your auntie. Ah, yes, bingo. Yeah, that's a great one. I forgot. I forgot about that salad. Yes. Um, I like to have a salad on the menu uh, that is wine friendly because um, uh, stranieri, you know, visitors really love to have a salad. Uh, part of it is a kind of a defense move because I hate it when people want to order just a green salad. And then of course they've ordered a great bottle of wine. So I try and have a salad that is gonna go great really show the wine fantastically no matter what it is that they've ordered so that duck that smoked dress, uh, duck breast salad is great yeah there's a lot of leafy greens in it uh, but the smoked duck breast done two ways and um, it sort of comes with a, a, a citrusy but it's not a tangy citrusy vinaigrette it is more um, you know, because uh, I use a lot of the zest so that you don't have too much acid that interferes with the wine. So it would go great with that. Okay, I see two things here on, on the menu for the preemie. And if you can recommend one of Paolo's wines, great. If not, it's okay. But I'm curious myself. I see heirloom beets with local goat cheese and a raspberry vinaigrette. How about that? Uh huh. Would that be a candidate for Grignolino? The, did you say Grignolino? Yes. That'd go great. It'd be okay. perfect. Right. I pickle the beets, so they're a little bit sweet and sour. Um, you know, they still have that great earthiness that beets have, but uh, just that little bit of spark in yeah, the Grignolino would go fantastically. With it. is that one? Because I've done the beets a different, a couple different ways. One is with smoked trout that I do, and another one is with goat cheese and hazelnuts. Is that one with goat cheese and hazelnuts? And fresh hazelnuts and, and goat cheese. Yes, right. Yeah that it would go great. It would go well with the Fraser also, quite okay. frankly. Where, where do you get the trout from? Where do I get the what, the trout? Yes, trota. Uh, so there, you know, we are surrounded by 10 mountain valleys and there are so many incredible products that come from, uh, from up in those mountain valleys. 
And uh, there is a producer of one of those mountain valleys that makes the smoked trout. And, uh, and I get it from them. Okay. Uh, took some digging to find that product, but once, um, you know, once I found it, I've just tried to always find ways to have that, that product on the menu. It's incredible. It's uh, up above uh, Tori Pelice. Okay. I don't know where that is. Tori Pelice. It's up uh, the Valley Pelice. So, well, I thought you said okay. towards yeah, okay. Pinerolo and, okay. and uh, to the west. What, one last item here. Again, I'm curious. So, we have a spicy octopus fingerling potatoes, bacon and chili jam, tangerine citronette. I, uh, what? That, that's, <laughs> that, that's quite an inspiration, that, just, just to read that and, and, um, and put that together. Well, what sort of, how, how did that come about? What sort of wine would you pair with that? So, that came about because, you know, the, the inspiration for those flavors, I mean, they're classic flavors. So this is sort of the way my, my brain works. Orange, black olive, um, uh, you know, there's a sort of uh, Sicilian. And what I discovered in Sicily is that the wines from Mount Etna, the red wines from Mount Etna, go fantastically with a lot of the seafood. And, um, <laughs> Uh, especially if the if it's not too delicate a dish and it has some richness and stronger flavors, it goes great with with uh, it would go fantastically, and I know it does go fantastically because I've had it with the Nebbiolo d'Alba, and I'd love to try it with the Longhi Nebbiolo. I can't wait right. for that. Right. So the thing that is sort of that earthy element that anchors that dish is the smoked tangerines in the smoky tangerine vinaigrette. So you have a little bit of, um, the, the octopus is charred, so you have a little bit of smokiness that comes from that, um, and the, the black olives and the uh, smokiness in the vinaigrette. I usually put a little melanzana and uh, some chechi in there as well. And, um, and uh, yeah, that the dish just works great. I know that people want seafood, but I have a lot of guests who really come for the red wine, you know, and they're really red sure. wine drinkers. So on the seafood, I, I try and do things that are gonna make it a little bit bolder. So okay. it'll pair nicely with red wine. Beautiful. I'm gonna read some comments here and I, you know, you. We deserve to hear some good news the way it's going, but, but uh, from Stephen Campbell, actually Stephen Linda Campbell, he says, uh, Ciao Denise, anything that comes out of your kitchen works for us. And he mentioned to me, he said, you've stayed with Denise twice, most wonderful accommodations and dining experiences we've ever had. Um, from our friend Suzanne Hoffman, she said, Ciao Denise, kisses and hugs. She's one of my favorite Piemonte pioneers. And from our friend, John Rittmaster, John, thanks for tuning in today. I know it's pretty early out in your part of the, the woods. Um, Viva Dolcetto, thank you. And he says he can't wait to come back and eat in that dining room. And I second that, and I'm sure many people watching today second that as well. So I've done such thank a Thank you, guys. Okay. Paula, I want to, we'll come back to you in a few minutes, Denise, but Paula, I want to get, what are your, some of your favorite food pairings with your wines? You mean with the, our, we speak about dolcetto? Oh, everything. So the, be it, uh, let's start with Gavi. What, what do you like with the Gavi? Uh, so Gavi, of course, you know, uh, the, the tradition of uh, Gavi is more closed to um, the Alessandria area and uh, of um, originally sold more in the past, especially in Liguria. So to our... Uh, to the seaside that is more closed to us. Uh, of course, Gabi is uh, uh, good to fish, I think, and uh, really to all the antipasti uh, that Denise was speaking about. You know, he, now we are at seven o'clock, so we have a dinner time. <laughs> okay, all right. And, uh, <laughs> so with antipasti, of course, and uh, I think uh, um, uh, you can drink also Gavi uh, for an aperitivo. 
even if now with the uh, problem of uh, coronavirus aperitivi are at the moment uh, not so frequent, but uh, uh, of course uh, uh, it's good or uh, in summer, uh, it's fresh, uh, it's very fruity, so it's uh, very easy to drink. I had it one time but, with, uh, with uh, the agave with the uh, risotto primavera, which was just one of yes, my... Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, uh, speaking, speaking about dolcetto, yes, uh, Denise, of course, was, say, was saying that it's uh, a wine you can drink with uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of dishes. Uh, what I can say to you that, uh, you know, uh, usually we say dolcetto is a wine you have to drink uh, young. Uh, so, of course, now we are selling and bottling dolcetto 2019. But dolcetto is the, the, the old way of drinking wine here in uh, the Lang, uh, so the everyday wine. And uh, old, old people is saying that our dolcetto, so I mean dolcetto d'alba coming from the Lang, is better in the second year okay. than in the first year. So of course, dolcetto is not a wine you have to age too long, but uh, uh, the grapes coming from uh, our area uh, bring to a dolcetto that can be aged without any problem for three, four years, uh, without any problem. Um, of course, it has to be fruity, uh, but uh, uh, in Italian we say ha uh, un retrogusto amaro uh, that makes it good for a lot of dishes, of course. Mm -hmm. I have a question here from Martin. It's Hanji or Hangi, I'm sorry if I mispronounced the name. Since you mentioned 2019, and she wants to know if you could say something about that vintage in general. Uh, so 2019, the same, uh, was uh, more rainy in spring. So we had, we had uh, a lot of rain in spring and uh, we had uh, really 10 days of delay in the vegetative growth. Uh, of course, this is not bad for us because we return to a more to an old way, so uh, to the old vintages uh, that were a little longer than the last we had. And um, of course, also in 2019, uh, we had rain and so we had uh, a lot to work uh, for the protection of the plants in the vineyards. Uh -huh. Um, we had only a small uh, a problem in September with hailstorms, uh, but uh, um, not uh, so strong in our area. So uh, not so strong in Barolo and La Morra, uh, but Denise, of course, know it. Um, they had very big problems in all the vineyards around Alba. Okay. Uh, and in our, um, in our property, we have a bigger damage in uh, Codana di Castiglione Falletto. Uh, not so uh, big uh, problems in uh, Barolo and La Morra, but th this was uh, uh, September. Yeah, I, I, and, I was there last year and I saw it, it just was intermittent. It, there'd be a little bit of hail damage in Sierra Lunga and then the vineyard yeah. next to it had no damage. Yeah. It was very strange. Yes, it was more, yes, Serra Lunga. Uh, the, the worst area was close to, to Alba, um, not uh, uh, in Barolo and uh, La Morra. Uh, but of course, uh, hail in September is, uh, uh, is also in a relation with the climate changing because in the past, uh, of course, uh, we had hail storms, but they were especially in summer with very hot days. And uh, uh, in the last years, it's not unusual having hail also in September or in spring. And this is different than what happens in the past, of course. Okay. One, one other vintage, a, a question came from a gentleman. I'm sure that most people have not received or tasted the 2016 Barolos yet. So 2016 yeah. is current for them. And, uh, one individual emailed me and he said he wanted to know about your 2015 Barolo. Were, were the extractions the same? Were there, were there any challenges uh, in that vintage? Yes. So, um, uh, 2015 was uh, a little more different uh, because so, uh, at the same we had rain in spring. Uh, so, it was, we had good uh, water reserve. Um, we had also snow in winter that is unusual in the last uh, years. 
uh, and um, uh, of course, uh, so we had uh, a little more hot summer. So in uh, July and in August, we had very high temperature. Um, and of course, it was necessary to uh, not uncover the clusters uh, in the vineyards uh, because uh, so the sun was, uh, was very strong. Um, uh, we had to pick up the grapes uh, 10 days earlier, uh, but uh, so at the end uh, uh, we were happy with our grapes. Uh, also in this vintage we had good balanced uh, elements, uh, so sugar was uh, uh, 14, 14 and a half, that is uh, okay for, uh, for our wines that had to be aged. Acidity was the same uh, at a good level. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, uh, I think everybody's speaking well about this vintage that looks able to be aged uh, also in this case for a long time. Good. We have about, Denise and, and Paula, we have about five minutes left, but I always say, until they kick us off, we're gonna stay, gonna keep doing this. So if we go a few minutes extra, because this is so much fun and I think people have learned a lot. So Paula, there's actually, one more question for you actually comes from Denise. And I don't know if Denise, you wanna ask her, I'll, you typed it in or I'll just ask, but go ahead. It was about, Denise wanted to know with the current situation, of course the wineries closed, but are you making preparations for winery visits and for tastings for the public? In the cellar? Uh, yes, so uh, now we have uh, uh, people that is uh, reserving uh, one ta uh, wine tastings for, um, uh, so I think we will start middle of June. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, here in Italy now, um, people uh, uh, is not able to come to us because the foreign countries are closed for us at the moment. And uh, Piemonte, that is our area, has a bigger problem with the coronavirus. So uh, now I think they will open uh, the frontiers in uh, middle of June. Uh, okay. Of course, for people coming from Europe, it's easy to come uh, by car. And uh, so I hope and I think people will arrive with end of June and July. Of course, for people coming from USA, it's a little more difficult because uh, you have to wait that your situation will be a little better and then you have uh, to take, uh, uh, so you, I think you need a little more time, but with uh, uh, people coming from Europe, I think we will start uh, in the next two weeks. Okay, good. D Denise, are the, are, the, are the borders closed to Americans to come to Italy or from other countries or how does that work? Well, at, at the moment, borders are closed. First of all, borders are closed between regions here oh. in, in, in Italy. Really? Those okay. will open the first part of June. I think it's June 3rd, isn't it, Paola? Yes, it's middle June, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So then first the region, the, the border between regions will begin to open. And then uh, borders will begin to open between European countries. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know that we have an exact date for that. And it is kind of confusing, quite frankly, because uh, different countries are doing different things. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to know the situation. I have a friend uh, and a, a guest who's been coming from Paris for years and wants very badly to come and asked me to let him know as soon as the borders between Italy and France open. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of waiting for that. And I don't think that there is a specific date even for that yet. Um, that Which, said, hotels are open, okay. restaurants are now beginning to open. But the, the thing with the borders is a little bit, you know, it's a little bit confusing. What obviously this is not very easy for you to make plans, but what, what I, when do you think you'll reopen the restaurant? I'll uh, reopen the restaurant the middle of June is what okay. the plan is right now. I'll take advantage of the beautiful courtyard garden that we have uh, this year to space the tables. I will actually put tables on the lawn, so there'll be tables. There's a around, there's a lawn that goes all the way around that 
wonderful fountain there. Beautiful fountain. And so yes. we put tables. There'll be about five tables on the lawn, okay. and then probably about seven tables under the terraces, under the grapevine, and under the the closed patio. And I'll probably even put a couple of tables out at the pool, to tell you the truth, because since I don't have hotel guests, there's nobody using those. Uh, those uh, lounge, those chase lounges. Right. So well, there's a couple of, couple of spots out of the pool for a table, exactly. Right, yeah, fingers crossed for everybody. So uh, technically we're out of time. I, we could probably go another couple of minutes, like I said, until they kick us off. But anything else you want to say, Polly, want to add anything or? No, of course, we, we hope, uh, uh, so we are Azienda Agricola, so of course we had the possibility to work all the time. And uh, for us, uh, so it's, it was easier, but of course for restaurants and hotels uh, that are in close relation with our, with our job, it, uh, it's more difficult, I understand it. I think probably this year uh, we will enjoy uh, our clima. We hope uh, this summer we can, we can eat outside. Uh, because of course this is a good opportunity also for the restaurants and the hotels to start with. Yeah. 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 And, and lastly, have your export markets, have they continued to buy wine from you? Is that slowed down? I mean, obviously, yes, I have situation. to say that uh, uh, so uh, we are working good. Uh, maybe it's also Barolo 16 that helps uh, us yes. to sell the wine. <laughs> it was a very good I'll keep thing. writing nice things about the wine, so that'll help, right? So. <laughs> but yes, we had at the moment no problems in uh, selling the wines. Also uh, for foreign countries, uh, also UK market and so on, they have big problems, but they are still buying our wines. We are selling to US. Uh, and uh, so at the moment we, so we are, we are happy, even if of course we can't say uh, completely happy because uh, we have to look outside, but uh, for the wine, uh, uh, it's not a so big problem at the moment. Okay, one last question, because we really have to go, but it's from David Loeb. He's got a couple of questions here, but just briefly, what are your favorite vintages? And, and, and when, it's for Barolo, Canubi and Bernate. And, and, and when are they at the best time to drink? So what? if we speak about a little older vintages, uh, I uh, so I enjoy, uh, for example, Barolo 2005. 2005 was a little um, difficult vintage at the end because we had a lot of rain uh, during harvest, uh, but uh, we had the, the, uh, the uh, opportunity to pick up the grapes, uh, so a big quantity of grapes before the rain. And so we had a very, very good uh, Barolo um, from the grapes that we pick up before the rain. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had a second barrel that was not the best that we pick up after uh, this time. But so a part of Barolo 2005, uh, I think is aging very, very well. And uh, I love it. Okay. Uh, of course, 2008 and 2010, I think, are uh, very good wines uh, to drink now. Uh, so, you know, in Italy, we drink not so old wines like you do in USA. Uh, and so I think 2008 and 2010 are vintages that at the moment are uh, very good to drink and to enjoy with your friends at the table. And Denise, you have those on the list, yes? 2008, 2010? I do. I do. That's, that's that's one, one, been one of the great things about... Yes. Uh, uh, Francesco Rinaldi, uh, they have uh, some older vintages. They're hard to keep on the list, but um, I do I do have those. And I love, uh, I think I've got 2009. I love 2009. Uh, 2010, I may not have anymore, I forget. 2011, I loved 2011, still do. Um, so, uh, you know, even the ones that, the vintages that didn't get a ton of press, they didn't get the really great, you know, huge press. Those vintages are, are fantastic, a little bit easier to find, and uh, I think they're absolutely wonderful, stunning. Uh, I did a webinar with, with uh, Nicolo Alberto the other day from Traded Berry, and he talked about 
we were talking about 2014, which is a vintage I think is very underrated, and about how certain vintages, certain wines, he, what he called horizontal, they fill your mouth and you think, wow, what a big rich wine. But he said, sometimes those are not the best wines to drink. The ones that have not a horizontal character to them, but a vertical character, they, they go down your throat easily. They, there's a long finish. Those are the most satisfying wines to him. And, and uh, you know, not the ones necessarily get the biggest points. So it. Exactly. I mean, I, I have to agree. I was perfectly happy to, to buy and have 2014. Um, I, it's a very elegant wine. I mean, it's a really great food wine. Yes. Uh, maybe, you know, doesn't rate as high on those sorts of, because it doesn't stand out amongst all the other wines, perhaps, that the taster is tasting. But it's a fantastic food wine. I agree. Yeah, that vintage is wonderful for that. And, and on that note, this, this was fantastic to, to be able to spend an hour with both of you. So, Denise and Paolo, grazie a tutti. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much, Tom. Okay. It was wonderful I, to be here. I definitely, I definitely will be back as soon as I can. Hopefully, it's by September or something. But grazie. Thank you. Then hopefully, things will be somewhat back to normal. Look forward to having you, Tom. Great. Thank you. Okay. Ciao. 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 Ciao, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thanks to everybody for tuning in today. Great. Paula, enjoy dinner. <laughs> <That's it. laughs>